fun to be back with you. We had a lot of fun last year, and I'm honored to be able to uh, participate in the conference again, and thank you for the Andres and for the founders of the, the summit. Um, I'd like to get to know who's in the audience today before I start. It helps me get a little more comfortable because I get nervous talking. Um, how many people here are entrepreneurs? Okay. Um, <clears throat> truth be known, I'm, I'm just an entrepreneur. I, I might be on the, on the other side of the table right now as an investor, but every year since I've been a kid, I've started up a company and sold it every two years. Since I was eight years old, lemonade stands, lawn mowing business, pool service companies, and I've done 11 of them. Most of them failed. Some of them succeeded, and, um, and I'm getting better at it over the years. Now I'm, I'm an investor, but I'm really just an entrepreneur. How many investors are in the room? A few of us. How many engineers, scientists, hackers? Okay. Um, how many sales and marketing people? All right. Any, anybody from the university sector? Government. Okay. Uh, who did I miss? Anybody? All right. We got everybody. Um, so today we're going to talk about the hyper innovation world we're living in. When I started my career, there was no internet, there was no smartphone, uh, there were no hard drives on computers. We had floppy disks. Um, and, and the pace of innovation has been exhausting. Every year since I can remember, the, t the innovation has been doubling, the speed of computing power has been doubling. And how do we operate, in a, how do we operate and keep pace with this, in this environment? And so we're going to talk about some, some principles that will help us today and keep pace. And I, I thought we were going to have something up here on the screen, so I'm going to have to look back to see what I'm talking about. Sorry about that. So we live in this hyper-competitive environment, and before we start, talking about hyper-competitive innovation and this, this change we're going through, I think it'd be helpful to, to talk about what is innovation. So I'm going to, you guys feel free to stop me, talk about this, this could be interactive. From the audience, can anybody give me a definition of what is innovation? Do something in a better way. Love it. Make a big difference? Love it. Has to be implemented, change. You're changing something, it's true. Any other definitions out there? Ideas that add value. Okay, so there's, there's incremental innovation, so you're incrementally adding value, or there's disruptive innovation where you have, you're completely changing a paradigm. There's one over here. What was it? Somebody shout it out. One more. To break the established, to break the established um, process or way of doing things. All good, innovate, all, all good uh, definitions. It's funny, I was on a plane. For those of you who didn't have a, a definition, it's okay. I, <laughs> Um, I was on a plane f traveling from Monterey to, uh, to Texas, and this girl sitting next to me was getting her master's in innovation. I said, that's awesome. Can you, what's the definition of innovation? And then she struggled for 10 minutes, and she couldn't give me a definition. So it's a word we, it's a word we throw out, but we really don't really understand. So I'm going to put my definition. It's not the right one, but I'm just going to put my definition up there. My definition is the intersection of invention and market insight. What does a faucet have to do with Square? Well, Jack Dorsey, the founder of Square, his friend was trying to sell a faucet for $2,000. And he couldn't sell the faucet because the person buying it only had a credit card and he couldn't take credit cards. So this market insight that small businesses can't sell things because they don't take credit cards was Jack Dorsey's inspiration to come up with his invention. So the intersection of an invention and market insight. So we could start with an invention, I have something cool, and I go apply it to a market problem, or we can start with a market problem and apply it, find a technology to solve it. So why is innovation accelerating? Well, first of all, we have greater connectivity and greater education than we've ever had in the history of the world. With the internet, we are, we are connected with um, and hyper-connectivity. We're communicating, we have greater access to knowledge and information. On the education side, entrepreneurs have learned the secret of the lean startup process. I wrote a book called Nail It and Scale It, helping entrepreneurs understand 
the process for how to take an idea all the way to market and, it, and iterate rapidly. How many here have heard of lean startup principles? So about probably at least a third of the room. This knowledge didn't exist five years ago. Ten years ago was zero. And so as more of the people understand the Lean Startup principles, we have more market insight. We're seeing the world differently. On the other side, we have accelerating invention, lowered infrastructure with the capabilities we have with Amazon Web Services and cloud computing. You all now have access to supercomputers for almost for free. Unthinkable 20 years ago, now the world has access to hyper um, uh, computing platforms. Capital. We have more access to capital and more capital than ever in the history of the world. And so you, you combine these, and we now have this vortex. We are, we have, the pace of change is greater now than the history of, of, the, of civilization. And, it's a, and to be frank, it's a little overwhelming. So in the middle of that, is gener we're generating more companies and entrepreneurs than ever. FinTech is experiencing the same explosion of this hyper-innovation and more startups that are happening. This is just a small sampling of some of the more successful companies that are happening year after year in the United States. And as I was preparing for my presentation, I thought, this is awesome. How many of these companies have come down to Mexico? And the answer is none. <laughs> what in the world? Of all of the FinTech companies I was able to research from the United States, Fewer than 10 have expanded into Latin America. The, actual, the number might be fewer than five. 10 is a generous number. Why does, why does FinTech have an immigration problem? It's not Trump's fault. He's not president yet. <laughs> There's no wall. Can anybody answer that question for me? Because I'm totally stumped. Don't they have enough money? Regulation, OK. Culture, oh man. I'm gonna just sit down and have you guys give the presentation. The cost of doing business. The cost of doing business. You guys have nailed it. Let me give you a case study. So it, the FinTech didn't used to have a problem. Um, well, it, it, in the version 1.0 of FinTech, when there was the wild west of commerce, um, we would try lots of different things before the regulators kind of locked us down. So this is an example. I'm a good friend of mine, he's a president of a very large bank in the United States. I can't say the name, but they told us that we went, I took one of our companies from Mexico, the CEO of MFM, and I took him um, to Utah to get a bank account. And I met, I met with the president of the bank, and this, I'm so proud to introduce my friend. That I said, we will never, ever give any Mexican business a bank account at this bank. Like, you're embarrassing me. Like, I, I brought my buddy down here. You just give him a bank account. It's easy. Like, it's easy, right? He said, it'll never happen. And he told me a story. Why? He said, we, we went to Mexico, and we had a very ambitious sales team. And they were signing up hundreds and hundreds of Mexican businesses. And one guy was extra ambitious. He would go to the, to the different border towns and to Monterey and elsewhere, and he'd sign up the cambiosas, the exchange houses, and got them all bank accounts. My eyes were, like, huge. I said, are you kidding me? I said, you know who those are, right? He said, I said, yeah, those are... A lot of those are money laundering organizations for cartels. <laughs> so you're giving all the cartels bank accounts? He goes, yeah. <laughs> and, we, and, and so we got slapped with regulatory issues, and we, they ended up being able to, you know, they, they do not do business in Mexico. So the regulations and the corruption and the anti-money laundering have halted innovation at the border. And you've called out the reasons, regulatory issues, Narciso had it this, this morning. It was so appropriate to have him open the conference. That relationship with the Secretary of Economy is the most important relationship for opening up the innovation capacity of the country of Mexico. That is the number one most important relationship. It's not the only one, but it's the I would put it at the top of the poll. Culture, huge culture challenges and issues, not understanding the nuances of doing business across border. Um, relationships with banks, and the issues that they're dealing with right now with anti-money anti laundering laws and corruption have frozen everybody wondering how can we take that step without, without living in a high-trust environment. Now, the, this is, is this good news or is this bad news? 
It depends who you are. If you're a U.S. fintech company, you're not, a, you're not opening up new markets. It's bad news. If you're an entrepreneur living in Mexico or Latin America, this is pretty good news. Because although Square Lending Club and Ally Bank don't exist in Mexico, we do have Banca Wool, Payclip, and Cubo Financiero, the, the parallels to those companies. And, and when, um, when we were investing into Clip, um, the, the, the CEO um, met with Jack Dorsey and asked him, and Jack Dorsey came to Mexico City and asked him, are you coming to Mexico? And he says, we have no plans to come to Mexico. So the great news as an as a entrepreneur in Mexico, you have time to innovate. You have time to change and think about um, how you're going to build your company. And, and you, have an, you have an opportunity to build your company with some breathing room. All right, so if I falls off again, come, come save me. In addition to cross-border, you know, we call this geographic innovation. Um, there is truly unique innovation happening in Latin America. And, and here's three examples of companies in Mexico that are experiencing some very, have, have created very unique disruptive plays. Switch, that allows you to pay your electric bill and many other bills online with an app. MFM, cross-border um, financing to help import ex companies import and export. They, they give out over a billion dollars a year in loans to companies that are importing and exporting using the foreign exchange mechanism to, to allow, uh, to give out these loans. The, um, the, the float, basically taking the, the difference on the float. GoSocket, this is a Chilean company that is doing uh, in innovation in the uh, financial services space using invoicing, electronic invoicing. All right, so just because we have time doesn't mean we have, we can take all, all the time in the world. And, and if we're gonna be building out hyper innovation or companies that are gonna be competing at a global scale, there's some basics we need to understand to build a solid foundation in order for us to compete effectively here in Latin America. This might seem counterintuitive, but in order to move faster, we need to slow down. We need to focus and, on, and identify and work on the fundamentals before we launch our, our companies. So the pair of tennis shoes up there represent the famous basketball coach, John Wooden. He coached for UCLA for many years. When John Wooden would bring his team on the floor for the first time, the first thing he did with his team was he had them put on their socks. And he sat next to them and said, let me teach you how to put your socks on. Make sure that your toes um, are square, that there's no wrinkles in your socks. And it's pulled up firmly. To, um, and then after he helps them put their socks on, he helps them put their shoes on. Make sure it's open, get the laces right. And he said, by the way, he said, why, why do I want you to get your socks figured out? Because if you don't have your socks figured out right, you're going to get a blister. And if you have a blister, you're going to lose playing time. And then I'm going to get fired. So you need to get, you can't have a blister. So let's focus on the fundamentals. He did this with all of his players the first day of practice. Focused on helping them get their shoes on and their socks and die, tie the double knots so their shoes don't come untied. That basic, and he, then he built from the ground up a world-class team was the winningest, one of the winningest teams in the history of college basketball. We're going to talk about some of the fundamentals, some of the things that we take for granted in, this, in the startup world, and, and talk about a few fundamentals that we can use as entrepreneurs, investors, hackers, <laughs> uh, scientists, uh, university professors, to build world-class startups. And, uh, and hopefully we can um, share some ideas and experiences with each other. The first is customer. The most important thing you're going to do as a startup is to understand who is your customer. It's extraordinary how many custom companies that I work with do not understand truly who their customer is. And it's not just who your customer is, it's the job the customer is trying to do. It's the pain they're experiencing in the context of that job. I wrote a book called Nail It and Scale It, and I have some tools that are available for you. One of the tools I should recommend you use is the bigideacanvas.com. This tool was developed to help you identify who your customer is, what their problem is, and the potential fit between your, your idea and, the customer's, and your solution and the customer's problem to help you identify customer product market fit. 
there are some interesting things in the canvas, for, such as what level of pain is your customer experiencing while doing their job? Is it a mosquito bite of a pain or is it a shark bite of a pain? They help you figure out, can you sell your company to Google? Google buys companies that are like toothbrushes, that, where you use the product two times a day or more. Frequency is actually more important than level of pain, in many, uh, especially in consumer startups. The, the purpose of the canvas is to ask you a bunch of questions. I ask you when you fill it out, be honest when you fill it out. It'll help you generate a hypothesis. In fact, it's a hypothesis generator. And as entrepreneurs, we will come to a company with a product in hand. And sometimes that product will blind us to the reality of the customer's needs because we're trying to tell the customer in the market what they want as opposed to listening to them. The Big Idea Canvas will help you generate a hypothesis. So you fill out the canvas, and then it will, it will ask you questions. And there's an online interactive version also that will be an automatic hypothesis generator. And I like to say, fall in love with the problem. Don't fall in love with the product. Fall in love with the customer problem. Don't fall in love with your solution to that problem. And that, that nice nuance will help you build a compass to get where you need to go. If, you're, if you fall in love with your product, your product will blind you. If you fall in love with the problem, your team will have the, the, the unified vision to come up with how we better can solve that problem as, an, as a team. The next most important thing, and I heard here in the audience, is culture. Culture covers a lot of things. My friend Stephen Covey, who passed away, said, with people, slow is fast. It takes a while to build culture and understand culture. And let's talk about culture at, different, at multiple different levels. Knowing yourself and knowing the cultural differences in your organization is critical. Knowing your competitor is even more important. Let me give you an example. This came from Harvard Business Review. I wish I had had this years ago. I would have made fewer mistakes here in Mexico. So, as a, as a, my, although my mom was born and raised in Mexico, I was born in California. And so I'm very expressive, but I'm also very confrontational because I'm from the United States. My friends from Spain, aún más. <laughs> And I was just having this conversation earlier. Very, and if you're from the Basque region, even more. So now the problem is my friends in Mexico are very, very emotionally expressive, just like me, but they're non-confrontational. So I think we're having a good conversation, right? And then, we, and then we hit the wall, and I have no idea what happened. Let me give you an example. I'm talking to my, my partner in Mexico City at one of my funds. And I said, okay, we have this tool we use to solve problems in our offices in the United States. When you have a problem with somebody, you take that problem to the individual directly, and you confront them about the problem. And he looks at me, and he said, we will never do that in Mexico. I thought he was an idiot. He thought I was rude. Who's right? How do you know, you know, and, and so we didn't have cultural context to understand how we were, how to interact and communicate with each other. So because of that lack of knowledge, trust started breaking down in our organization. Um, my, a good friend of mine, his mother-in-law is always coming and micromanaging the kids and the family and telling the wife what to do. Well, he's non-confrontational. And so he just sits there and watches his wife get beat up month after month until his wife explodes. <laughs> It's pretty important to understand that there are nuances. My son just got back from Sweden. They're non-confrontational, they're non-expressive. <laughs> you have to guess what a Swede is thinking. It's just, you have to look for very slight clues. And I'm Swedish, but I'm born in the United States. So I'm Mexican, Swedish, American, I'm really messed up. <laughs> Another way of understanding how to uh, build trust is, is how we, is there, there's a continuum of how we, uh, how, we, how we give trust and take and establish trust with others. Also really important to understand, in the United States, we use cognitive trust. Are you capable? Is your product work? Do you present yourself well in meetings? Are you um, an effective uh, operator? Cognitive trust, things that we can observe. However, with my Mexican mind, it's effective trust. Did I have dinner with you? Are you my friend? Are you my family member? Um, do we share experiences? Do we laugh together? I trust you in Mexico because I spend time with you. 
I trust you in the United States because you're, because you're capable. Who's right? Nobody explained this to me. My mom didn't explain this to me. And so I, this is a huge barrier. And you can, so you can see some of the cultural issues, why technology just can't launch across the border. It hits the wall. But it's an, it's an invisible wall. It's not, it's not a, a built wall. It's this cultural barrier. OK. Continuing on the theme of trust. Startups happen at the speed of trust. Stephen M. R. Covey says, business happens at the speed of trust. Startups times 10. Why is that? Because if you don't have trust in the organization, you don't have flexibility. Like, if I don't trust you, and you know if you make a mistake, you could get fired, you're going to keep your, you're going to pull your head back into your shell, and you're going to be like a turtle. I'm not going to take a risk. But in a high-trust environment, you're going to take a risk, because you can. Because you know if you fail, you won't get fired, unless you're the Secretary of Economy. Um, flexibility. What does trust have to do with flexibility? Because I can try stuff, and flexibility enables creativity. And creativity enables innovation. We don't have startups if we don't have trust. It is the foundation. What I have observed in Latin America is that the startup communities are very tight, and they've built a, a nice trust environment within startup communities. The broader community has a, lo a, a lower trust coefficient. Different geographies in Latin America are, are accelerating their trust coefficient. One of those is Argentina. It's amazing what's happening in Argentina right now. I just got back from Argentina. I spoke at their, 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 their business summit this last week. The trust coefficient in Argentina is exploding. And it's being led by the president of the country, President Macri, who's created an open, transparent style for the country. So it's not just the startup community who's super innovative and high trust. It is the whole business sector that has transforming itself. And this is an interesting photo. Um, next to me is the president of Argentina. Next to him is the ambassador of the United States. And this, for the first time in 20 years, the Argentinian president was inside the US embassy. We were hosted last night in the British embassy. Thank you. It was lovely being there. I wore a tie, because I didn't dare not wear a tie to the British Embassy. And everybody else had t-shirts on. I felt stupid. <laughs> um, all right. Warren Buffett says, trust is like the air we breathe. When it's present, nobody notices. When it's not present, everybody notices. Corruption. <sighs> all right. I, we we got to talk about it, right? Um, it's interesting. The, the darker the country, the higher the corruption. How many can answer this question for me? Isn't it interesting? Do you think there might be correlation between poverty and corruption? Because you look at those countries that have a higher corruption, they also have higher poverty. There might be correlation there. Is it possible? World Bank says if you, want to, if you eliminate corruption in a country, you can 2x or 3x the GDP of the country. Two to three X. So how many people here would love to eliminate poverty in the world? There was a couple of bankers that said no, okay. <laughs> but most of you raised your hands. For those of you who raised their hands, here's how you can do it. Promise to yourself that you will have high integrity in, all, in every situation. Because the difference starts with us. If we have high integrity, we will reduce the friction of doing business in our environment. People will trust us. Business happens at the speed of trust. Lower integrity, the wheels come off, right? It's impossible to get things done in a low trust environment. A high trust environment, lightning fast. You can do deals on a handshake and know that's going to happen. Low integrity, you can have hundreds of attorneys and still have low trust. Operating in Mexico is difficult. It's very difficult. We, you cannot trust the rule of law in Mexico to protect your company. And so we have to deal with this. If we want to speed up our ability to do business and compete on a world scale, we're going to have to address this someday or another. And I think the entrepreneurs of Mexico, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart, are capable of making that change. We're not, it's, not going to with the, with the, it's not going to happen with the established um, old tradition, old guard that is operating with in corrupt environments. It's going to be the entrepreneurs that have nothing to lose, right? Because if we have a high, op high operate in a high trust, transparent environment, el que no tranza no avanza. <laughs> what the hell? 
Who came up with that one? Un political pobre is un pobre politico. I know who came up with that one. <laughs> that is not true. That is not true. That is absolute lie. We've been fed a lie our entire careers, and we have to stop it here. Okay, moving on. My so get on my soapbox. Okay. Team. Team is critical, and, and, the, and having a high-quality team dramatically improves our ability to move at speed. A world-class engineer is 10 times faster, better coder than a good engineer. Now, the, in, in addition to the engineers, we need a startup team around those engineers. And I like to say we need a hacker, a huckster, and a hopeful. I, I did these, and so you can, you can beat me up, but I, I think Superman's my favorite. He's the hopeful. He's the visionary. He can see through walls. He can see the future. He can say, this is how it's going to be. He can go to the future and go to the past. He's the visionary. Now, you need an engineer. You need a hacker to build that vision. And they needed, they needed a huckster, somebody to sell it. And let's be honest, Batman's not really a superhero, right? He doesn't have any, like, he just has lots, lots of tools on his belt. But he sells it really well. <laughs> All right. So how do you maintain this startup team? How do you keep these guys motivated? And how do you make sure you maintain the right culture in your organization? The guys that have high-performing teams do this on a regular basis, quarterly, sometimes monthly. The CEOs go through the organization, and they say, who are the high performers in the organization? And you can tell by their performance and you know, feedback. That's easy. The other thing they look at is, who has the highest cultural fit in our organization that represent our corporate values? And they drop the employees into the quadrants. So what do you do with the person on the bottom left? Low performance, low culture. You fire them. How soon do you fire them? Fast. By noon that day, fire that guy. Okay? What do you do with the guy in the top right quadrant? Super high performance, good cultural fit. You promote him as soon as possible. You provide incentives. You put golden handcuffs on them. All right? Here are the tough ones. What do you do with a person who has a high cultural fit but low performance? Hmm? Motivate them. Give them another chance. Maybe find another seat in the organization. Give them another shot at it because they're a good culture fit. Maybe they're, they're not a good sales guy. Maybe they should go to customer support. Okay? The bottom right quadrant is the toughest. Super high performer, but he's caustic. Poison to the organization. What do you do with that guy? You fire him. How soon? By noon that day. Once you know you have a problem, it's already too late to make a change. Do not let a bad culture ruin your organization. It takes a lifetime to build a reputation. It takes five minutes to lose it. So periodic performance employee reviews, I don't think they work overall, but this is an interesting tool that the CEOs can use on a regular basis to make sure that you maintain a high-performing, high-culture organization. Okay. A couple more thoughts. Core competency. World-class companies operate at the intersection of a deep core competency and a large market problem. Most people I ask have no idea what their personal core competencies are or their organizational core competencies. If I were to ask you right now, what's your core competency of your organization? You're going to go, uh, because that's what everybody does to me. Uh, I don't know. And you think about it. Think about it. I'll help you think about it as you're thinking about yours. What's Honda's core competency? They have many of them. What is their primary key core competency? Engines. Honda builds world-class engines, and they put them in all of their products and service and all their products. They've built an empire around being the world leader at combustion engines. Last tool I'm going to leave with you is that of accountability. When we grow an organization, our goal is to grow quickly and improve our rate of performance. One of the best tools I'm going to leave with you is this concept of accountability. When performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported, the rate of improvement accelerates. As a, many, many startups come to me and they say, we don't want to have a board of directors, we don't want to be told what to do. When I was a CEO, 
the most effective tool I had was reporting on a monthly basis to the board of directors what I told them was going to happen, what were, what were the key objectives. And as I reported back on a, on a periodic basis, the more often I reported, the, the faster I improved inside of the organization as I was digging down because I knew I'm going to have to report back to the board. Before we can go change the world, we need to slow down and focus on the fundamentals of ourselves and our organization. And remember, startups happen at the speed of trust. Thank you for spending time with you. I don't think we have time for questions. And so I appreciate the opportunity and good luck with the, with the event today.